Chapter Twenty Six of China by Frank G. Carpenter. This recording is in the public domain. The Great Chinese Wall. I am at Shanghai Quan, which lies on the Yellow Sea at the eastern end of the Chinese Wall, and is the last outpost of China proper before the northbound traveler enters Manchuria. It is a city of little commercial importance, but as a buffer between these two sections of the country, it has been in the midst of hot fighting again and again. In recent years, during the warfare between the Peking Army and the forces of Shang So Lin, the warlord of Manchuria, Shan Hai Quan has been bombed by Manchurian aviators who flew their planes over territory once successfully defended by Chinese archers stationed on top of the Great Wall. Shan Hai Quan is 262 miles from Peking on the line that extends from the Chinese capital to Mukden, the capital of Manchuria. I was in China when this line was open to traffic and was on board the first special train to pass over it, going from Mukden to Tianjin. On the present trip, I am traveling in the opposite direction, having come from Peking back to Tianjin and thence northeastward to Shanghai Quan. We left Tianjin in the early morning, making our way through myriads of grave mounds, passing the city of Tongku at the mouth of the Peiho River, and turning to the north, where stand the ruins of the Taku forts. Standing on the platform, I could see the scores of windmills that pumped the brine of the Yellow Sea into the salt pools of the government reservoirs, and could watch the gangs of coolies cutting down the mountains of salt and loading it for Tianjin, whence it is shipped into the interior. I rode for an hour over salt marshes upon which were grazing Mongolian ponies, cattle, and donkeys, and then entered the rich garden lands of the Great Plain of North China. Here every inch of soil is cultivated, and the farmers were everywhere laboring in the fields. Shanghai Quan is now four miles from the eastern end of the Great Wall of China, which originally extended to the very edge of the sea at this point. From here, this mighty barrier that separates northern China from Mongolia and Manchuria goes over mountain and valley until it reaches the great desert of Gobi, 1,200 miles to the westward. If it could be lifted up and put down upon the United States, it would stretch from Philadelphia almost to the borders of Colorado, and if its twistings and windings could be straightened out, it would extend several hundred miles farther west. At its eastern terminus, time has gained the mastery over this stupendous work of man, and the end of the wall has crumbled away and become overgrown with moss and grass. Farther inland, however, it has weathered the passing of centuries, and one can see it climbing up the Manchurian mountains, jumping the gorges, and scaling the peaks. Like a gigantic serpent, it flings itself clear across China, winding its way tortuously over the greatest obstacles that nature could present. Although it is gray with age, parts of it still seem as imperishable as the hills whose hoary brows it crowns. Through its eastern course, the wall is from 20 to 30 feet in height, and its width ranges from 15 to 30 feet. If you will imagine a solid block of two-story houses 15 feet deep, built across the United States from the Atlantic to Omaha, you will have a faint idea of the size of this wall. Such a block, however, would be easy to construct in comparison with the work that was required to build this vast fortification. The Great Wall climbs up crags so steep that the bricks in it had to be carried on the backs of goats. It crosses peaks higher than any in the Alleghenies, and at one point goes over a mountain, the top of which is 5,000 feet above sea level. A large part of it has a foundation of granite blocks from two and a half to four feet thick, all of which had to be brought from long distances. The bricks of which the wall is made were put together in two parallel walls, each about three feet thick. The space between was then filled with earth and stone well brammed down. The top of the wall, which is also paved with these bricks, is everywhere so wide that two wagon loads of hay could be driven abreast along it without touching. I have seen enough of the building of railroads and other engineering works in China 
to understand how this wall was constructed the chinese had no machinery to help them and few cattle or horses were used every foot of the masonry was made by human labor and the earth and stones for the filling were undoubtedly brought up in baskets on the backs of that army of laborers of centuries ago as a feat of engineering the building of the great wall impresses me even more forcibly than the pyramids of egypt the greatest of those huge piles covers thirteen acres and reaches to a height less than that of the washington monument the great wall of china is so large that a fifty mile stretch of it contains enough brick and stone to build a pyramid higher than old cheops itself the chinese wall was begun seventeen hundred years before america was discovered at a time when our ancestors half naked and altogether savage were wandering through the wilds of northern europe when rome was still a republic fighting her last battles with the carthaginians and more than two hundred years before christ was born it was planned by the emperor shi huang ti whom i have already mentioned as the napoleon of china to a large extent he was the founder of the empire as he consolidated the many kingdoms of china into one abolishing the feudal system and dividing the country into provinces he began the canal system of china and built many of the ancient highways like alexander and napoleon he grew vain as time went on he decided that chinese history should begin with him and for that reason he committed an act that has made him in the eyes of the chinese the most despised and detested of their emperors it was he who caused to be burned all the books of history poetry and classic literature in china i have already told how for fear that there might be other books written than such as he desired he killed hundreds of the most eminent scholars of the empire it is said that not a single perfect copy of the chinese classics escaped destruction and that those that exist today were written by scholars who were not known to their ruler and who kept their work secret until after his death the imperial history of china says of shi huang ti that he had a high pointed nose slit eyes a pigeon breast a wolf voice and a tiger heart and that he was stingy cringing and graceless in spite of all this it must be admitted that he was a great executive especially in materializing his plan for a wall across china to keep the enemy hordes from the north from swooping down upon his country's fertile plains he drafted as laborers all the prisoners of war and all the criminals in the land with three hundred thousand troops to help and to keep the workers in order and this vast army never ceased its labors on the wall for fifteen years although the emperor himself died during this time the original wall was by no means the formidable structure it became in later centuries and its western portion never has been as important as that in the east the part of it west of the yellow river was largely a protecting rampart for the trade road between china and the west but as the chief purpose of the eastern stretch was to keep out the tartars it was constantly guarded and kept in repair it was almost entirely rebuilt in the sixth century and from time to time was extended and its route changed at one time it is said a tsin ruler put up a large sector in ten days by the forced labor of a million men during other eras it was neglected and after it had failed to keep out the mongols who ruled china in the thirteenth and fourteenth century it had almost no use and was practically forgotten marco polo who visited china at that time makes no mention of it whatever with the ascendancy of the chinese mings the great wall once more became an important barrier this dynasty determining that never again should the wall fail to keep back the invaders generally reconstructed it throughout its entire length and built a new stretch of three hundred miles they strengthened and enlarged it with heavier masonry built massive gates through it at the passes in the mountains erected fifty-foot watch-towers above it at every two hundred yards over part of its length and inaugurated a better system of guards and signal fires to keep watch for and give notice of approaching enemies in sixteen forty four when the throne was again seized by a race from north of the barrier 
the great wall began the deterioration that has continued ever since while it is still intact for hundreds of miles other parts of it have today crumbled into ruins and even disappeared entirely no archers now guard it no soldiers parade its top and it remains only as a monument to the millions of men who two thousand years ago worked to protect their homes and those of their descendants from the invaders from the north the best place to visit the great wall today is at the nankow pass about twenty-five miles north of peking and not far from the ming tombs the gate at this great gap in the mountains was formerly the neck of the bottle through which passed the chief caravan trade between peking and mongolia today the wall has been cut through for the railway that now connects peking with the city of Kalgan, and which will no doubt eventually be extended on to urga this railway has now become the chief freight carrier in the territory through which it runs but nevertheless it is far from displacing entirely the camel trains and to the north and west of Kalgan, camels and an occasional motor car are the only modes of transportation it is estimated that more than one hundred thousand camels are employed in carrying tea alone from Kalgan to siberia before the railway went through the wall at the nankow pass all travel had to go through the pa ta ling gate the great archway that dates from the fourteenth century it is built of massive blocks of marble exquisitely carved and is covered with inscriptions in six different languages besides those in chinese mongolian and tibetan there is one in sanskrit one in ancient Uyghur, and another in tangut which is today one of the rarest and least known languages on earth the trip to the great wall at nankow can now be made in a few hours in comparative comfort but before the railway was built it meant a journey of several days the first time i made it was when i was taking a honeymoon trip around the world my wife and i engaged donkeys and mule litter our party all told consisting of ourselves three pigtail chinese and four long-eared mangy beasts there was nan shu king who was our english-speaking guide and cook a mohammedan mafu or groom and a ragged dirty donkey boy who ran behind and kept the animals going at full speed by poking a stick into their bellies the mule litter was an arrangement somewhat like a dog kennel covered with cloth and swung between two poles about thirty feet long these extended out in front and in back to form two pairs of shafts which were bound to saddles on the mules the interior of this litter was filled with blankets and was just large enough for one person to sit or lie down within it it was far from comfortable and for the greater part of the trip my wife and i consigned it to the guides and rode the donkeys ourselves i wish i could show you one of these peking donkeys and its queer saddle still a common enough sight in north china the saddle is made of a number of blankets strapped one on top of the other until they stand out like the flat board on the back of a circus horse the stirrups are heavy pieces of iron tied to these blankets with pieces of rope and the bridle is more often than not merely a rude halter the donkeys themselves are not much bigger than a newfoundland dog and when loaded down with all this paraphernalia not to mention a rider on top they almost disappear while riding along i remember remarking to my wife that she seemed to be sitting rather far back on her mount that may be was the reply but at any rate i can't see anything of his head but the tips of his ears there is now an excellent hotel at nankow but travelers who want to explore the country more than a day's ride away must still carry their own food and bedding with them and must stay at night at one of the rude inns of this region these hostelries usually boasting some such name as the inn of increasing righteousness or the inn of accumulating prosperity are never clean and seldom comfortable they are not far different i judge from those of palestine in the days of the savior low one-story brick buildings they extend around open courts in which droves of hogs and camels are kept adding their grunting to the braying of the donkeys and mules the wall here at nankow is a much more solid structure than at shanhai kwan and from the watch-towers above the pass 
it is possible to get a more magnificent view of it than elsewhere along its route the snow-clad mountains of mongolia with the caravans of camels moving along them stretch away to the north until the camels become the size of kittens and sky and mountains meet in the horizon to the south is china also mountain covered and cutting the landscape is this great stone barrier its towers rising above the peaks themselves and extending on and on as far as human eye can see end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of china by frank g carpenter this recording is in the public domain the manchus ancient capital stand with me at the top of the great drum tower of mukden and take a look over the city we are in the capital manchuria the ancient home of the manchus and the birthplace of the last dynasty to rule over the chinese empire for a thousand years or more the city has occupied a prominent place in the history of china from the days when its tartar and mongol hordes swept down over the great wall to battle with the chinese to the present time when a manchurian warlord heads at mukden one of the most powerful of the independent military factions that have sprung up since the birth of the republic among the earliest known inhabitants of manchuria were the Khitans, who were in the 10th century established the liao dynasty and ruled over what is now southwestern manchuria eastern mongolia and a part of northern china two centuries later they were conquered by the new chens the founders of the qing or golden dynasty and the real ancestors of the manchus the new chens in turn were overthrown about 1200 a d by the mongols under genghis khan the grandfather of kublai khan and their manchu descendants did not return to power until 1644 when they seized the throne at peking built on a pedestal 50 feet wide through which two tunnel-like roadways cross each other the drum tower rises 100 feet above mukden in passing it i noticed a wicket gate standing open and slipped in ahead of me i found two flights of stairs with high narrow steps up which i climbed to the great drum that hangs among the pigeon roosts under the roof this spot offers the best vantage point in mukden and is the place from which i ask you to look with me in your imagination over the city below us mukden is a panorama of temples and palaces gateways and towers and shops and houses stretching out on all sides are the low one-story buildings of gray brick so crowded together that their ridge roofs from banks of black tiles above each side of the checkerboard of streets crossing one another at right angles over the whole rise the roofs of the great temple-like buildings of the old imperial palace of the manchus their yellow tiles shining like gold under the sun here this dynasty reigned before it achieved supremacy at peking and here during the succeeding centuries the manchu emperors made pilgrimages to reverence to their ancestors and the officials came to register their grief whenever a ruler of that dynasty died erected in 1637 by the founder of the qing dynasty the palaces of mukden are much like those of peking but on a smaller scale for hundreds of years they were the repository of a library of thousands of volumes of priceless jewels and precious stones and of articles of rare workmanship in silver and porcelain worth their weight in gold since the fall of the empire the books and many of the relics of the old manchu splendor have been removed to peking and the buildings have been slowly deteriorating the great chambers and halls are now festooned with dusty cobwebs and littered with the feathers and droppings of the pigeons that fly in and out while the grounds surrounding them are strewn with rubbish and straw beyond the old imperial palaces are the modern ones erected for the former viceroys these now contain the residence of the governor general of manchuria and his officials and the offices of the various departments of the government they are immense one and two-story buildings covering a half dozen acres in the days of the empire when the imperial viceroy lived here tartar soldiers armed with guns stood at the gates and richly dressed manchus passed in and out all day long 
Today they are the headquarters of General Shang So Lin and the independent revolutionary government of which he is the head. Around the inner city of Old Mukden is a great wall built of brick thirty or forty feet high and wide enough for two automobiles to be driven abreast on it. At its four corners are turrets overlooking the city, and above its eight gates watch-towers rise high into the air. From each of these gates broad avenues extend in every direction. Lining them are the principal stores and buildings, while between them are other streets, narrow and irregular, dirty and smelly. Enclosing the whole in a great circle is a second wall made of mud. Like the inner one, it has eight entrances through each of which the roadway winds about through towers and walls, so built by the ancient Manchus that the evil spirits in which they believed should get lost in attempting to follow their twists and curves. Not far outside these encircling walls of their ancient stronghold are buried the early Manchu emperors. Their tombs rival in splendor and ornateness the imperial palace itself. I drove out yesterday over the four miles to Pei Ling, as the North Mausoleum is known, passing in turn the mounds of an old Chinese cemetery and a golf course where the foreign residents of Mukden were driving their balls over the green turf. The East Mausoleum, or Tung Ling, is ten miles from the city, while the ashes of a third emperor lie buried in still another tomb, Yung Ling, almost a hundred miles distant. All this is the old Mukden. There is also a new city built by the Japanese, which is the Mukden that the traveler first sees upon arriving. The Japanese control the South Manchuria Railway, and all along it, on their leased territory, they have founded settlements with Western improvements and Western progressiveness. Coming here from Shanghai Kwan, I traveled all day from the eastern end of the Chinese Wall, and just as the sun was setting, rolled up to the imposing station of the new Mukden. On the second floor of the station building is a modern hotel, one of a chain operated by the Japanese throughout Manchuria. About it centers the Japanese city, with its paved streets, its modern stores and office buildings. Except for its Japanese signs and the motley crowd that meets the trains, it might almost be a city of our Middle West. The traveler welcomes its comfortable hotel, takes advantage of its up-to-date business methods, and sighs with relief at its cleanliness. Indeed, one finds everything here but atmosphere, and for that he visits the walled city. The two or three miles between the new station and the old Mukden may be covered by motor car, horse-drawn street car, carriage, rickshaw, or even in one of the hooded, springless mule carts that fairly jolt the bones in one's body. The road passes within sight of the memorial erected to the tens of thousands of Japanese soldiers killed here in the war with Russia, goes by hospitals, schools, and factories, and then, before reaching the wall, winds through the foreign settlement. Here are the various consulates and the homes of the foreigners in Mukden. Stopping at the Consulate of the United States, I found it housed in an old temple, its doorway guarded by a grinning stone monster almost as high as the building itself. But now let us climb down from the drum tower and take a walk through old Mukden. The crowds on the streets are not much different from those of the Chinese cities south of the Great Wall. The Manchus, although originally much stronger and larger physically than their neighbors to the south, have been almost entirely absorbed by the Chinese, just as their language has been. Nevertheless, the strain of Manchu blood still shows in the physique of many of the people. In comparison with the Chinese of Canton, some of them are giants, the men being often six feet tall, with big frames, heavy bones, and large heads well set on broad, full shoulders. The Manchu women are especially fine-looking. They are large-framed and broad-hipped, and they carry themselves erectly as they pass along the streets. They walk with a swinging stride, for their feet have never been bound like those of their Chinese sisters. Their native dress consists of pantaloons, over which is worn a long coat reaching to the ankles and often lined with fur. Every girl rouges her cheeks and eyelids, but it is her headdress that especially distinguishes a Manchu from the other women of China. 
her gorgeous coiffure far outdoes in splendor the most elaborate ones ever devised by american hairdressers atop the head of a manchu lady is a framework of gold silver or other metal that often extends out so far on each side that she has to turn sideways when going through a door over this her shining black locks are twisted and coiled until the whole is indeed a fearful and wonderful creation such headdresses make these women seem at least a half foot taller than they really are their height is increased still more and often to a startling degree by the shoes that many of them wear these have wooden supports three times as high as a french heel extending down from the center of the sole such a shoe is always the badge of wealth and culture as no working woman could go about in them as we continue our walk through old mukden we are carried along by the stream of humanity animals and vehicles that flows through the streets of this city from morning till night we have to pick our way carefully and at times must even jump into stores to keep from being crushed by the crowd mingled with the pedestrians are automobiles gin rickshaws and huge wheelbarrows pushed by sweating chinese there are freight carts loaded with bean cakes coal or millet and hauled by donkeys and mules single or double or three or four tandem and innumerable two-wheeled carts without springs covered with blue denim hoods and drawn by mules now and then one sees a foreign carriage with coachman and footman in livery and occasionally a pair of horses with great hoops over their shoulders hitched to a droshki a reminder of the russian influence in south manchuria we pass peddlers selling everything from ice cream to live crickets in tiny cages and calling attention to their wares by all kinds of noises one a shrill whistle that rises above the general babble of these teeming streets may be heard in almost every block it is long loud and continuous still it took me some time to learn whence it came at first i thought it might be from the whistle that these people tied to the tails of their pigeons to scare off hawks but i afterward learned that it was the signal of the hot water peddler this occupation constitutes the life work of many men in mukden they always do a thriving business as fuel is carefully conserved by the poor people who prefer to pay a fraction of a cent for enough hot water to make tea for a family rather than go to the expense of building a fire of their own passing money exchange shops bookstores dry goods stores jewelers and photographers we finally reach a long street not far from the drum tower occupied entirely by brath smiths here are rows of shops in each of which a half dozen men in blue jackets and trousers sit before low anvils pounding out brass dishes pots and basins they make also candlesticks and chafing dishes for charcoal incense burners beyond this block is one of silversmiths shops where one can buy the most exquisite hairpins and bracelets of silver decorated with enamel such wares are sold by weight an extra charge above the actual value of the silver being made to pay for the workmanship among the stores of mukden are many selling shoes hats and caps of all kinds we see winter shoes and summer shoes shoes for working men and shoes for officials there are men's boots of felt and creations of all sorts in silk satin and fine leather for women there are felt shoes with soles an inch or more thick they look clumsy and heavy but they are unbelievably light and remarkably cheap the coolies work in shoes of leather that are much like moccasins while the wealthy chinese and manchus wear high boots of black silk and velvet as a sign of his business the shoe merchant displays a wooden boot painted white green and red and quite large enough to be the shoe home of the old woman and her numerous progeny of nursery rhyme fame not only the shoe dealers but other storekeepers as well have queer signs over their shops some of these figures advertise the merchandise for sale but many seem to have no connection with the goods sold they are made of brass or wood in the form of birds fish dragons and beasts and i am told that they are often handed down as heirlooms from generation to generation the caps of mukden are of as many kinds as the shoes 
and are made of fur, silk, and felt. They can be seen by the hundreds on any main street, stacked up outside the stores upon shelves along the walls of the buildings, or inside shops that sell nothing else but hats and caps and fur ear tabs. For years, Mukden was the chief fur market of China, and although Tianjin and Harbin have now forged ahead of it in that respect, this city still has a considerable fur trade. Northern Manchuria swarms with wild animals, and raw pelts are brought here for sale from hundreds of miles away. There are tanneries in and about the city, and one sees leather and fur stores everywhere. The skins are displayed just as they come from the tannery, or are sewed together into large coats, which are afterward cut down and fitted to the size of the buyer. Many such furs are used for the inner lining of the brocaded satin or silk garments of the wealthy. Some are worn with the hair outward and with the silk inside. During the coldest weather, the Tartars in the northern part of Manchuria wear almost nothing else but furs. The coolies have suits of sheepskins and goatskins, and those who can afford it wear fox, mink, and sable. All the houses are poorly heated, and such clothing is worn indoors and out. In addition to the vast number of skins used by the natives of this region, Mukden exports tiny sables worth almost their weight in gold, tiger skins that sell for hundreds of dollars each, leopard hides, and the furs of wolves, badgers, goats, and lambs by the thousands. A large share of these go to America, which buys also bales of squirrel and foxtails to be used for trimmings and thousands of dog skins to be made into beautiful rugs. Manchuria is so cold in winter that dogs here grow unusually long, thick coats. Between Mukden and Siberia are many farms where these animals are bred for their pelts alone, much after the manner of sheep farming in Australia. To some extent they are fed on coarse millet and scraps, but for the most part they are allowed to forage for their food. In those regions, dogs are often given as wedding presents, and a girl sometimes receives a dozen or so as her dowry. Inasmuch as they begin to breed when eight months old, such a gift is a good foundation for a small fortune. The killing time is early in the spring, while their coats are still long and thick, and they are usually strangled to death so that their fur will not be damaged. The Manchus in the past believed that dog meat had medicinal properties and, like the Chinese, they still use tiger bones and claws and deer horns in compounding their remedies. In this connection, the story is told of a Chinese doctor who was trying to cure a Manchu mandarin of dropsy. The tiger bones and cat claws he had prescribed had been of no avail, and he was reduced almost to desperation, when one day he saw the German consul walking along with his two new dachshunds, one black and one brown. As the story goes, the physician had a long-standing grievance against the German, and immediately he was struck with an idea whereby he could settle his grudge and cure his patient at the same time. He straightway told the Mandarin that the only medicines that would really benefit his dropsical legs were two long-barreled, short-legged dogs with drooping ears. What you need, said he, is to get a black dog of that species for your right leg, and a brown dog of the same breed for your left leg. Cook their meat into stews, and the rich broth will flow into your legs and drive out the dropsy. The Mandarin thereupon sent out his servants in search of two such animals, and before the German was aware that his pets were missing, they had already been transformed into stew. Whether or not they cured the dropsy is, of course, another story. End of chapter 27《Chapter Twenty Eight of China by Frank G. Carpenter. This recording is in the public domain.》Farms and Farming in Manchuria. Manchuria produces two crops, soybeans and bandits. Thus runs an old Chinese proverb, which is as true today as it was in the past, and as far as the former commodity is concerned, more applicable than ever before. In another chapter, I shall speak of the bandits of Manchuria. Today I write of the soybean. It has been cultivated and used here for 5,000 years, but was never commercially important until after the Russo-Japanese War, 
when it entered into international trade through a shipment made to England by the Japanese firm of Mitsui and Company. Since then, the rise of the soybean in Manchuria has been phenomenal. Now, as the principal export of the country, it is the chief factor in increasing the prosperity of the people individually and of the region as a whole. It thrives throughout most of Manchuria and much of North China, and is cultivated over vast areas, on a great deal of which, before the official suppression of the opium traffic, the pink and white blossoms of the poppy waved in the breeze. Although there are probably two score varieties of soybeans, the three of greatest commercial value in China are the yellow, the green, and the black ones. They grow in two or three inch pods on plants three feet high, and often are planted in alternating rows with maize, millet, and kao liang, the sorghum-like plant that furnishes one of the staple foods of the people. In coming here on the peking Mukden Express, even before reaching Shanghai Kwan and the Great Wall, I entered the region where the soy is king. As I traveled northward, I saw the beans everywhere, in long caravans of mule and donkey carts moving slowly across the country, and in bags stacked beside the railway tracks awaiting shipment. Later, at the stations, I saw piled up like so much cordwood the huge round cakes made from the residue left when the oil is pressed from the beans. At Dairen, the chief bean exporting city of Manchuria, these cakes, looking like so many cartwheels or grindstones, stretch along the tracks and wharves as far as the eye can see. Bean oil and bean cake have always been used by the Manchurians and continue to be the two chief products of this crop, but in the last decade or two, the soya has been utilized in hundreds of new byproducts, ranging from cosmetics to explosives. Its stalks make good stock feed, and the roots are burned as fuel by the poorer classes. The green leaves of the vines are eaten by the Manchurians, and what is known as bean curd is as staple of food here as is rice in southern China. Dried, the beans go into soy sauce, provide the foundation for our Worcestershire, and appear as coffee cheese, and milk substitutes. The dry bean cake is made into breakfast foods as well as stock feed, and the Japanese use large amounts of it to take the place of the fish with which they formerly fertilized their fields. As to the oil, the list of products that contain it is too long to enumerate. We eat it in butter and lard substitutes and salad oils. We use it in our houses in enamel, varnish, linoleum, paint, and celluloid and it appears also in toilet soaps and face lotions. Scattered over South Manchuria are more than 200 bean factories, ranging from primitive mills where the beans are ground by donkey power and the oil pressed out by hand, to great establishments equipped with hydraulic presses operated by electricity. Recently, a new way of extracting the oil by chemicals has been introduced and is now being successfully used by Suzuki and Company, who at Dairen have the largest bean oil factory in Manchuria. By this method, not only is more oil obtained from the beans, but the residue is not in cake form, and so is easier to use as a fertilizer. There are more than 70 of these yu fangs, as the bean mills are called, in Dairen, the city that the Japanese have transformed into one of the most modern ports in all China. It is the southern terminus of the South Manchuria Railway, over which come soybeans from every part of the country. Here, the mills turn out every day 400 tons of oil and 10 times as much cake, most of which is exported to Europe, the United States, Japan, and other countries in Asia. Not only in its production of soybeans, but of many other hardy grains as well, Manchuria is forging ahead to a place among the great agricultural lands of the world. Consisting of the northeastern part of the Chinese Republic, these three eastern provinces, as this region is called, contain more land than ten states the size of Indiana. Much of this area is covered with a soil just as fertile as that of our own corn belt. Nevertheless, not one-fifth of it is under cultivation today, and even that much has never been farmed to its fullest capacity. 
in riding over the country i have traveled for days through land that although it is as rich as that of any part of america is now practically waste as to the cultivated portions they are worked by men donkeys and oxen with almost primitive tools and with farming methods so crude that if they were employed in the united states we should not be able to feed ourselves one can only surmise the seven league strides this country will take in agricultural progress when power-driven tractors and modern farm implements are put into use here as sooner or later they will be the greater part of manchuria looks like illinois wisconsin or minnesota and the soil of its river valleys is just like that of the prairies along the mississippi much of it may be compared with the best parts of the wheat belt of canada and not a little will surpass in fertility the soil of the red river valley the country has some mountainous regions but the greater part of it is in wide valleys and rolling plains so rich they need only to be tickled with the plow to laugh with the harvest i have seen much of this manchurian countryside by taking trips out from the different cities by carriage and by motor car around mukden the fields have no fences their boundaries being marked only by stones the roads that cut their way right through the farms look more like ditches than highways i have gone over many of them with the carriage in which i was riding tilted at an angle of forty five degrees now our wheels would be in ruts two feet deep and at other times we would bounce high into the air as we went over drains crossing the road the road was frequently lined by great ditches on either side which i was told the farmers dig to keep the traffic from cutting out into the fields and destroying their crops as we rode along we met loads of sorghum seed hauled by rough manchurian ponies and carts piled high with bags of soybeans now and then we went by a grain shop where millet and sorghum seed were set out for sale in round basket-work bins the size of a hogshead and again we passed men and animals bringing beanstalks and sorghum cane into the city for fuel these people skin the land of its natural fertilizers every corn stalk every bean vine and every weed is saved for fuel even the stubble of the sorghum is pulled up by the poor people who are allowed to go over the fields after the crop is harvested they leave mother earth stark naked and the land is as bare as though nothing had ever grown here this has been done generation after generation and notwithstanding the soil is still rich the manchus do not live on their farms but herd together in villages of mud and stone houses built in the form of hollow squares in the center of which are yards for the pigs and chickens there are no barns and neither hay nor straw stacks about some of the settlements one sees sorghum cane and bean stalks stacked up or even piled on the roofs and against the walls of the houses these two products are the wood and coal of the farmer and furnish the fuel for cooking and heating the manchurian heating stove which is called a kang is a brick ledge two feet high that occupies one end of a room and has a series of flues beneath it by which it is heated when a little bundle of straw or corn stalks is set on fire in it the flames leap through the flues and make the bricks quite hot it is upon this ledge that the members of the family sit during the daytime and there sprawled out side by side they sleep at night among the villages rising high over the houses i saw many ragged trees every one of which was filled with what i first thought were birds nests i was told however that they were bunches of mistletoe these are found in every part of the country and being air plants are as destructive to the trees as are the orchids of tropical climes going closer i had a chance to examine this species of mistletoe it is scattered all over the trees and its pretty yellow and red berries may be seen shining out of the green of almost every branch it is so plentiful that i can only wonder what would happen to the manchurian bells were the good old mistletoe traditions of england and america observed here the population of manchuria has never been determined by an official census although various estimates put the number of people in these three provinces and in eastern mongolia at less than twenty five million 
not more than one tenth of these are descendants of the original manchu race the remainder are chinese japanese and russians the majority of the population is in the southern half of manchuria which is fairly well settled above mukden the farms are widely scattered and there are huge areas of government land that are being thrown open to immigrants for two hundred years after the ascendancy of the manchu dynasty manchuria was a forbidden land to the chinese reserved as a hunting and fishing ground for the nobles and the officials it was closed to immigration by everyone else except a few persons allowed to enter to gather wild ginseng and falcon feathers thus it was that this vast fertile territory remained so long undeveloped and unfarmed while to the south parts of china proper that were subject to recurring famines swarmed with human life today the chinese in manchuria number millions and every year almost another half million coolies from the provinces of shantung and chi li migrate here to work on the farms during the summer while a few of these coolies settle here permanently most of them return home after the harvesting season in order to avoid the severe winters although manchuria is in the same latitude as parts of spain france and italy its climate is more like that of central canada with hot summers and long cold winters as to the japanese in manchuria they are found chiefly in the cities and towns in the zone of the south manchuria railway they have not been able to compete successfully with cheap chinese labor on the farms manchuria contains enough unsettled land to take care of all japan's surplus population but the japanese colonization attempted after the war with russia proved a failure the people who came over did not take to chinese methods of farming and most of them who had expected to make fortunes overnight have gone back to japan in north manchuria near the boundary of siberia the russians occupy much the same position as the japanese do in the south droshkis are in common use in the cities and towns russian signs are seen over the stores and even many of the chinese use the russian language in their everyday life before the world war a great movement was in force to colonize eastern siberia with emigrants from european russia a movement that caused much speculation as to whether a thickly settled russian territory in this part of the world would not eventually result in another russo-japanese conflict at one time the russian government was putting fifty thousand immigrants a week into these regions the people being brought in not as individuals but as whole villages at a time old and young and men and women all coming together however all this was stopped by the world war and the ensuing revolution and the vast areas in eastern siberia that the czar once planned to make the greatest wheat lands in asia are still at the beginning of their development here in manchuria and especially in north manchuria wheat is grown largely being second only to soybeans as the chief crop of the country both climate and soil are adapted to it indeed wheat sown here in april matures six weeks sooner than that grown in the same latitude in the united states like all crops in manchuria it is planted in rows about eighteen inches apart just as we plant corn or potatoes these rows of wheat are each year sown by hand in furrows that remain from the preceding year and a plow is run along the sides to cover them in most places the wheat is weeded and occasionally it is even hoed as we hoe cotton a curious feature of manchurian farming is that the rows are never straight but wind their way over the fields with all the undulations of a marcel wave they are perfectly parallel and remarkably regular but never straight a tartar farmer whom i asked why this was so replied that one could get more grain from a field of crooked rows than from one of straight rows after the harvest the wheat is threshed by being pressed under stone rollers pulled by donkeys led round and round by children it is winnowed in the wind and then ground in rude native mills or else sent to one of the half dozen or so modern flour mills that have been recently erected in manchuria these establishments are known as womos or fire mills 
while a native factory is called a mofang which literally translated means grinding house during the world war the wheat and flour industry here increased to such an extent that by 1919 manchuria was exporting wheat to europe such exports however later fell off and manchuria has continued to import american flour it buys also our wheat to mix with the native grain as the american product is a much harder and firmer variety than that grown here these imports are handled largely by the japanese who when they begin to build up a market for flour bearing their trademarks are said to have put the american product in japanese packages the manchus and chinese are noted for their faith in trademarks if they once like an article they will stick to it blindly even though the quality may later change for this reason there are old store signs in china that sell for several hundred dollars apiece just because they may be relied upon to bring in trade even as many chinese are too poor to eat rice so are there millions of manchurians who cannot afford to use wheat for food they live instead mainly upon millet and cow liang the latter is cooked like rice usually mixed with vegetables and eaten with chopsticks the grain is a valuable food for animals too while the stalks are put to use in making fences bridges and houses and in weaving mats i have ridden for hours through fields of this grain which grows higher than a man and which because of this fact has been found to be a most excellent hiding place for bandits at present the leading factor in developing the agricultural resources of the country is the south manchuria railway it has a big experiment farm at chung chu ling between mukden and harbin and other smaller stations at various points near the route of the railway it has brought in sheep hogs and cattle for breeding purposes and has one establishment devoted solely to reforesting wastelands and planting trees in new regions among the products being grown successfully in manchuria by the japanese are sugar beets tobacco rice and silk tobacco is raised as far north as the latitude of canada and the experts of the american tobacco company say that if the plants were properly cultivated the leaf produced would be as good as that of virginia the rice is raised both on dry land and on flooded areas in the region around mukden ten thousand koreans have been brought in to work in the rice fields as to silk that from manchuria is known as wild silk about four million dollars worth is produced annually as in parts of shantung the silkworms here feed upon oak leaves instead of those of the mulberry and the fabrics made from their silk are different kinds of pongee or tussa many of the cocoons are unreeled on native hand filatures but more and more are being sent to antung on the border of korea which is becoming the silk center of manchuria attempts are being made as i have said to improve the cattle of manchuria by better breeding but little can be accomplished until the work can be carried also into mongolia where most of the cattle in this part of the world are raised the natives there breed their cattle in certain places where the bulls are kept as soon as a good-sized herd is accumulated they drive them from place to place over the wild prairie uplands to find pasture when the cattle are fat enough for the market they drive them to the russian or manchurian cities for sale one of the principal markets is the town of sitsikar which during september and october of each year has its population increased by thirty or forty thousand mongol cattle dealers as to the pork of manchuria no white man eats it if he can possibly help it the hogs are the scavengers of the country they are seldom fed and they root about through the mud and filth living on all sorts of vile stuff as a result they are black bristled big stomached small hammed hungry looking animals much like our razorbacks but with flesh by no means so good the sows are very prolific having from twelve to fourteen pigs to a litter by proper cross-breeding they might be turned into excellent stock in addition to improving its livestock and its crops manchuria is now realizing the importance of its forest resources and so is planting several million young trees every year to take the place of those that are cut 
there are thick forests along the yalu and sungari rivers and on the former stream rafts bring the lumber down to antung for export another lumber center is kirin at the head of navigation on the sungari which is noted as a junk building center and has several sawmills including one owned by the japanese mitsuis End of chapter 28chapter 29 of china by frank g carpenter this recording is in the public domain in the hung hutza country for decades manchuria has been overrun by bands of brigands who have one of the most remarkable organizations on earth at the height of their activities they surpassed in number and daring even the african Tuaregs, the veiled camel-mounted bandits of the sahara they are known as the Hung Hutzes or Red Beards, a name that arose from their early custom of dyeing their hair and beards a fiery hue. Thus decorated, they evidently wanted to become synonymous with the devil in the minds of the people of North China. They seem to have been successful, as from childhood on, the Manchurians have always looked upon the Hung Hutzes with the same fearful respect that the American child used to give the traditional boogeyman today the hung hutzes have been temporarily reduced in number by many of them joining the army of general chang so lin and the scene of their depredations has been pushed farther and farther into the outlying districts even so they still operate as highly trained units of cavalry infantry engineers and an intelligence corps divided into battalions of about two hundred and fifty men each they are commanded by captains and lieutenants under a discipline far more strict than that of the Chinese National Army. During recent years, every battalion has been equipped with rifles, revolvers, and machine guns, all of which remain the property of the battalion leader and are not individually owned. Each unit is restricted in its operations to a certain territory, but as to the nature of its activities, there seems to be no restriction whatsoever. From their dens and hiding places in the mountains, the bandits, always well mounted, swoop down upon railway trains and rob the passengers, exact tribute from merchants transporting freight by cart from place to place, sack entire villages, and hold wealthy persons captive for big ransoms. They employ secretaries and bookkeepers to keep records of all the men in each band and of the proceeds from each robbery. At the end of the summer, they deduct their expenses from their plunder, about half of the net income going to the leader and the rest being divided equally among his followers. They usually then disband for the winter, many of them working as coolies until the following spring. The hung hutzes are so organized that they can combine their forces at short notice. They use modern means of communication or, when necessary, light fires on the mountains as signals to their fellows many of these signal lights are made of wooden pegs hollowed out at the top and filled with a highly inflammable composition halfway down each peg there is a hole to which a fuse is attached when this is lighted the composition blazes up making a bright flare that lasts several seconds the message to be sent is indicated by the number of flashes given in other words a kind of primitive dot and dash code. Every band of hung hutzes has its secret agents scattered throughout the region where it operates, and almost every isolated village has to pay a tax to be immune from raids. The spies of the bandits are employed even in the government offices, and one's coachman or chauffeur may be a brigand in disguise. It has not infrequently been the case that village policemen have themselves been hung hutzes, and that the officials of the larger cities have often been in alliance with them. In the days of the empire, soldiers were sometimes sent to execute any official discovered to be a hung hutza. They usually returned bringing what they claimed was the head of the bandit, but which, if the truth were known, was more often the head of a coolie whom they had killed instead. The hung hutza spies notify the brigand bands what cargoes of goods are to be shipped and when and as far as possible 
report the wealth and importance of the shipper. Indeed, the merchants of Manchuria have always been the ones to suffer most from these brigands, whose chief revenue has been the tribute exacted as a payment for letting the freight caravans go unmolested, or the plunder captured when this tribute was not paid. A shipment of opium has always been considered a particularly choice booty. The merchants have submitted to such blackmail for centuries, and have at last come to regard it as a necessary item of expense, just as we do postage stamps. Not only the merchants, but also every traveler who goes over backwoods Manchuria on foot, by cart or on horseback, must pay tribute. When this is done, a bandit passport, as it were, is issued. These are little red-bordered flags printed with Chinese characters, certifying that the bearer has paid his toll and that he is not to be held up again. Not a few merchants, when they have valuable shipments to move from one place to another, take additional precautions by hiring companies of brigands to go along with them as escort. Even foreigners are not exempt from the attacks of the hung hutzes, and many a missionary has been robbed of his money and belongings and left by the roadside. In the case of rich Chinese, the victims are usually kidnapped. Not long ago, a silk trader was caught within five miles of the city in which he lived and carried off to the mountains, where the hung hutzes kept him until the $30,000 they demanded as a ransom was paid in full. I have heard of one instance of a hundred carts starting out across the country to Mukden, all but two of which had paid the tribute demanded and bore hung huts of flags. The men and goods in the carts so flagged completed their journey in safety, but the others, who had refused to pay the toll, were attacked by the bandits before they had gone fifteen miles. The goods were stolen and the drivers were killed. During my stay in Mukden, I talked with the agent of a big mining concession owned by an organization of British and Japanese capitalists. He was opening up a gold region in the Kirin province and had to send his supplies across a wild country to the mining camps. He said he dared not start out a single cart without buying protection from the bandit leaders, and that in important cases he usually employed one of the brigands to go along in person. My drivers might have gone through all right with the hung huts of flags on their carts, he told me, but outside this big organization of brigands there are petty bands of robbers who often attack caravans. These petty thieves, however, live in fear of the larger organization knowing that they will be killed if they are caught robbing anyone under the protection of the hung hutzes. The province of Kirin, which lies to the north of Mukden, is one of the chief hunting grounds of the hung hutzes. Much of it is mountainous, and the rough country affords good hiding places for the bandits, who collect a heavy toll on the cart traffic always moving through that region toward the railroad. Some of the caravans are protected also by armed guards, furnished by private insurance companies which have distinctive flags of their own to notify bandits that the goods they insure are under their protection. Ostensibly, these guards are to frighten off the hung hutzes, but it is an open secret that the money the insurance companies pay the brigands and not their guards affords the real protection. The hung hutzes as a whole are daring and courageous men. They seem to have no fear of death whatsoever, and they fight bravely although having no physicians or surgeons at their service, they know that anything more than a slight wound means intense pain and suffering. Many of their depredations are directed against the railways, and all the way from the Great Wall to the Siberian boundary trains are continually being held up. For this reason, practically every train in Manchuria has armed guards on it. Some of the bandits carry on their activities also along the coast of Manchuria, going about in junks and capturing sailing vessels and the smaller trading craft of the Chinese. If they are chased by police boats, they sail up into the shallow streams where the larger vessels cannot follow. A Japanese gunboat that once captured two of these pirate junks found more than $300,000 worth of silver on them. The pirates frequently lie in wait for the trading junks as they come out of the rivers and make each one pay toll and when business is dull, they leave their boats and pillage the towns on shore. 
the power and activities of these manchurian bandits are largely the result of the political chaos that has long existed throughout china after the boxer uprising for instance they were at their strongest for many years their strength being augmented by large numbers of recruits from the boxer forces for that matter whenever china is engaged in a war or revolution the hung huts's profit as they can carry on their depredations with less danger of interference on the part of the authorities also their forces are sure to be enlarged by soldiers who fighting on the losing side are often suddenly left without work or wages and decide to take up banditry as a better paying profession the japanese have been accused of furnishing arms to the hung hutzes and using them for political purposes more recently as i have said many of them have been absorbed into the army of general chang so lin chang so lin himself was carried off by brigands when a boy and brought up as a hung hutza during the russo japanese war he joined the japanese army in which he served as a lieutenant later he became so powerful as the leader of the manchurian bandits that the peking government gave him a colonel's commission in the national army as an inducement to give up banditry accepting this commission he continued to rise in political importance finally organizing an army of his own and leading it against peking in nineteen twenty two he set up at mukden a separate government and is today the supreme ruling power in manchuria much of the recent development of manchuria has been due entirely to chang so lin's efforts to make these provinces self-supporting and commercially and economically independent of the rest of china all kinds of modern innovations have been introduced by him from the building of good roads to the use of airplanes in his military maneuvers general chang has put into effect also a more rigid army discipline and if necessary uses the most drastic measures to enforce it not long ago for instance he had two of his own generals executed when it was proved that they had been working the time-honored chinese institution of squeeze to their private advantage by putting into their own pockets a few cents from each soldier's monthly pay the police force of mukden is as well organized as chang's army and there are now uniformed policemen on every block in place of the long manchu gown of former days they wear padded black clothes that are almost european in cut they carry clubs as big around as a broomstick and almost as long and painted black to make them look like ebony or iron as a matter of fact these weapons are exceedingly light and a good blow upon a hard skull would no doubt break them into pieces general chang does not hesitate to fill the jails with offenders against his rule of law and order but he has also made many improvements in the penal system of manchuria in a visit to the mukden prison i found the criminals treated like men not beasts accompanied by two english-speaking chinese officials and a director of the penitentiary i went through ward after ward of two prisons in one of which were hundreds of convicts working away at all kinds of labor this latter institution covers about four acres it is surrounded by a wall of gray brick fifteen feet high and its front gate is guarded by two six-foot manchurian soldiers who presented arms as we entered the buildings are large one-story brick structures with heavy tiled roofs they are so built that they form a series of wings running out from a central point like the spokes of a wheel making it possible for a guard standing at the hub to command a view of four or five corridors and the cells opening off them the cells are about twelve feet square well supplied with fresh air and light and five prisoners are usually kept in each one they are heated by kangs that also serve as beds a bunch of burning straw sufficing to keep one room warm as we went through the outer gate into the prison grounds a gang of seventy-five convicts was marching in from work on the roads outside the city their prison garb consisted of a jacket reaching to the hips and a pair of thick trousers that looked as though they were made of quilted comforts such as we use on our beds they were light gray and each had a black cross painted on the back every man wore shoes of pigskin and his legs were so chained together 
that there was no danger of his running away. As I looked on, the director told me that the long termers could be distinguished by their collars. The ones with black collars were serving terms of 30 years. Those wearing blue collars were in for 20 years. Those wearing red for 10, while the gray collars meant still shorter sentences. Every prisoner learns a trade here, and all sorts of things are made in the workshops. The first shop we entered was devoted to saddlery and shoemaking. In another was a gang of carpenters and cabinet makers, and in a third about two dozen convicts were spinning and weaving. The spinners sat on the floor, turning the wheels with their hands, and the weavers were using looms worked by their feet. A number of them were making carpets and rugs, some of which were twenty feet square. Such rugs are made on a great upright framework. The weaving begins at the bottom, and as the work progresses upward, the men have to use scaffolds upon which they sit while they draw the threads in and out. All the work is done by hand, and the oriental patterns used are executed in many colored wools. From the workshops I went in to see the prisoners eating one of their two daily meals. As the men entered the ward, each one took from his back a little brown canvas knapsack containing his complete outfit for prison life. This consists of a folding camp stool, a pair of wooden chopsticks, and two porcelain bowls, each of which holds about a half pint. At a given signal, the men set up their stools on the floor, and at a second signal, they arrange themselves on the stools in two long aisles facing each other. Next, a gang of convicts who acted as waiters brought in great watertight baskets filled with steamed sorghum seed and vegetable soup. The sorghum was served first. It was shoveled out into dishes much like wash basins, and one of these was placed on the floor in front of each group of four men. From these basins, each convict filled one of his porcelain bowls. At the same time, the soup was passed around, each man putting some into his second bowl. In eating, the men picked the vegetables out of the soup with their chopsticks, mixed them with the sorghum, and then raised the bowl to their mouths and scraped the food in with the chopsticks. They seemed to enjoy the meal, which probably was much better than what most of them had been accustomed to outside of prison. Asking about the punishments inflicted here, I was told that the old barbarous practices had been discontinued, although the convicts are still beaten with strips of bamboo on their bare skins. For ordinary offenses, the men are put in dark cells, but not for more than five days at a time. At my request, the director showed me one of these, and even shut me inside to make the experience more realistic. The cell was triangular in shape, with one side just large enough for the door, the other two sides meeting in an acute angle at the opposite end. There was room for a man to lie down upon the floor, but he could hardly turn over without touching the walls. The room had neither bed nor chairs and was unheated. When the dark cell is occupied, food is thrust in through a little hole in the door, so arranged with a double lid that no light is admitted. With the door closed, the darkness in the cell seemed almost thick enough to cut, and I was decidedly relieved on being let out. In the courts of Manchuria, torturing prisoners to make them confess has been almost abolished, and chopping off the heads of condemned men has gone out of style, execution by shooting taking its place. These executions are usually carried out in wholesale lots, as it were, large groups being shot at one time. The executioner is a soldier who receives a certain amount for each man he shoots, and when he becomes tired or feels that he has earned enough money for one day, another takes his place. End of chapter 29「Chapter Thirty of China by Frank G. Carpenter. This recording is in the public domain. Where Japan meets China. I am in Daren, the chief port and industrial center of Manchuria. It is the finest city in the three eastern provinces and one of the most modern and progressive to be found anywhere in China, from Hong Kong to the border of Siberia. Nevertheless, as cities go, it is hardly more than an infant having grown to its present importance within little more than twenty-five years. At about the end of the last century, it was still a small Chinese fishing village known as Ching-Ni-Wa, 
the literal meaning of which black mud hollow undoubtedly gives the best and most concise description of it along in the nineties the russians began casting about for the site of a winter port to take the place of vladivostok which is frozen up for four or five months every year they selected this spot with its ice-free harbor on an inlet of the yellow sea and in eighteen ninety eight leased from the chinese the Liao tung peninsula on which it lies here extending up a slope backed by hills eight hundred feet high they founded the city they called dalny the far away it was laid out along much of the same plan as washington the principal streets radiating from three or four circles and with the intersecting thoroughfares forming several great spider webs the russians spent something like twenty million dollars in dredging the harbor constructing docks and port facilities and in erecting magnificent buildings for their business headquarters and homes then a half dozen years later came the russo-japanese war at its close the manchurian territory leased by the russians was taken over by the japanese and dalny passed from the dominion of the czar to the government of the mikado a large part of the city had been burned during the war many of the buildings were roofless and the chinese had carried away doors and windows by the hundreds they had even tried to steal the great russian stoves in the houses as to harbor works the japanese found a half completed breakwater and one pier with these as a nucleus they set about making dalny into the great port it is today changing its name to dairen they completed the docks and built new ones repaired the damage in the residential section paved the streets and erected new buildings everywhere indeed dairen has expanded even beyond its original plans and a movement is under way for the reclamation of a large area of land along the waterfront i wish i could show you the dairen of today it is a city of telephones electric lights and street cars automobiles broad paved streets and hard surfaced roads leading out into the country in the heart of its business section is the central circle which was the nikola circle of the russians from this park the principal streets extend in all directions and about it are located the chief buildings here is the imposing establishment of the yokohama specie bank as well as the homes of other financial institutions the chamber of commerce the post office the civil administration office the british consulate and the yamato hotel this hotel the most up-to-date in northern china is one of a string operated by the south manchuria railway in the largest cities in manchuria it is entirely modern in every respect with elevator steam heat to replace the big russian stove formerly used in each room electric lights telephones and billiard and reading rooms it has even a delightful roof garden with trees shrubbery waterfalls and artificial ponds laid out on the lines of japanese landscape gardening the meals at the hotel are served in western style but the waiters are pretty japanese girls clad in kimonos and long white aprons japanese boys serve as chambermaids the manager and many of the employees speak english and on the whole the service is good another hotel under this management is at hoshigara a resort only ten minutes ride from dairen by a good motor road here there are a bathing beach and facilities for sports of all kinds from an eighteen-hole golf course to a baseball diamond farther inshore from the business district is the truly magnificent residential section of dairen where are the homes of the railway officials and other prominent men these are handsome dwellings of brick and stone surrounded by beautiful gardens and facing wide streets this section is reached by crossing a stone bridge that reminds me somewhat of the million dollar connecticut avenue bridge over rock creek in washington although the one here is by no means so large if you could lift up the finest villas on the outskirts of a european city gardens and all and drop them down on the slope of a hill overlooking a beautiful harbor you would have a reproduction of this section of dairen indeed this famous city is more european than asiatic the population of dairen is a mixture of japanese chinese europeans and americans 
with Japanese composing more than half of the total number of people. The Chinese, for the most part, are of the laboring class. They carry the bricks and other materials used in the new buildings under construction, and they do the market gardening and all of the peddling. Many of them, of course, own property and are wealthy, but the largest and most modern business establishments belong to the Japanese. The European and American population is composed chiefly of the consuls and their employees, the missionaries, and a few commercial agents. The best way in which to realize the activity and importance of Dairen is by paying a visit to its waterfront. It has one of the finest harbors along the western Pacific and one free from ice the year round. The wharves extend for several miles along the Yellow Sea and have four great piers for large steamers and another for junks and small craft. Ships drawing 30 feet can enter at low tide, docking at the wharves and unloading their freight directly into the cars of the South Manchuria Railway. Steam cranes move on tracks up and down the piers and there is a granite dry dock 380 feet long, the only one in North China. The approach channels are indicated by buoys, while the inner harbor of Dairen is protected by a breakwater of stone and concrete two and a half miles long. It rises ten feet above the level of the highest tides and encloses a deep water basin more than 800 acres in area. During the Russo-Japanese War, this breakwater was blown up and partially destroyed, but it was afterward repaired and lengthened. With a foreign trade of nearly $200 million a year, Dairen ranks next to Hong Kong and Shanghai among the ports of China. The vessels of three ocean steamship lines call here regularly to say nothing of the innumerable smaller passenger and freight vessels, the river boats and the sailing junks that may always be seen in the harbor. In addition to the soybean products that constitute three-fourths of its exports, Dairen ships coal, furs, hides, and silk. Its chief commerce, of course, is with Japan and southern China, after which comes the trade with the United States. The Japanese have followed the Russians' example in making Dairen a free port, and through its wide-open doors, United States goods come in huge shipments. One American tobacco firm has a branch factory at Mukden. Farm implements manufactured in Chicago have been brought in for use on the government farms. A large part of the flour milling machinery is of American make, and all the rolling stock of the South Manchuria Railway was bought in the United States. Our chief export to Manchuria is cotton goods in various forms, which reminds me that we have stiff competition in this line from both the English and the Japanese. I came to Dairen from Mukden over the South Manchuria Railway which has the best roadbed and operates the finest trains in all China. Its butterfly-like emblem of an M and a cross-section of a rail may really be said to be the emblem of the new Manchuria, as this railway has been more important than any other one factor in the development of the three eastern provinces. The whistle of its trains on their way from Siberia to the Yellow Sea has sounded the death knell of the old Manchuria, and its gleaming rails have turned a land that three or four decades ago was almost a wilderness into the most easily accessible region in the Far East. The South Manchuria Line was opened in 1903, just about a year before the beginning of the war between Russia and Japan. After that war, it was turned over to Japan, along with other property in the territory leased by Russia. And in 1906, the South Manchuria Railway company was organized by the Japanese. The new owners leveled the roadbed, broadened the gauge of the track to standard width, double-tracked the line, and imported modern rolling stock from the United States. No steam shovels or other machinery were used in building up the new bed for the tracks, all the work having been done by cheap Chinese labor. The material employed was rock broken into pieces the size of sugar lumps. All along the line from Port Arthur northward, piles of this rock are still to be seen heaped up ready for use, marked with white paint at the corners and on top, and so arranged that the railway officials can tell if any of the stone is stolen. Covering the faces of the hills 
like so many blue-backed ants, are the Manchurian Chinese who break up the stone. They hammer the rocks into pieces and carry them to the tracks in baskets slung to poles that rest on their shoulders. The earth for all the embankments along the route was transported in the same way. The trains on this line are equipped with Pullmans, dining cars, and day coaches, as up-to-date as any in the United States. The car in which I made the 250-mile trip from Mukden had a reading room with the latest Asiatic papers and American and English journals, and in its diner I ate as good a meal as I could possibly ask for. As for service and cleanliness, I wish I could show you how spick and span the Japanese keep these cars. They dust them inside and out at almost every stop. They even wipe off the wheels and rub up the brasses again and again during each trip, treating the cars like so many new babies brought out for display. Altogether, the railway company has about 700 miles of track in the peninsula of Chosen, or Korea. The line from Port Arthur and Dairen to Mukden terminates at Shangsheng. North of this point, the track that connects with the Trans-Siberian is of narrow gauge, which fact has thus far prevented the Japanese from running their standard gauge trains into North Manchuria and thus spreading their influence into that territory. On the other hand, they are working on new feeder lines into eastern Mongolia and no doubt will some day control the transportation and industry of that region. From Mukden, another section of the South Manchuria line runs southeastward to Antung, where, after crossing the great 3,000-foot steel drawbridge built over the Yalu River by an American company, it connects with the Korean railways. This 180-mile stretch between Mukden and Antung was built during the Russo-Japanese War. It was originally of a narrow gauge less than a yard wide and carried little cars only eight feet long. There were no passenger accommodations whatever, and the heavy freight rates prohibited any large traffic over it until the new standard gauge track was laid in 1908. Belonging to this railway and under its management are the great coal mines of Fushun, and the iron mines and steel mills of Anshun. Manchuria has valuable deposits, also of gold, silver, lead, and asbestos, but none of them has been developed to the extent of its coal and iron. The Fushun mines cover about 15 square miles and yield an average of 3 million tons of bituminous coal a year. It is of sufficiently good grade for smelting and manufacturing purposes, and is also used largely as fuel for the Japanese Navy. As to iron, it is said that the Manchurian province of Fengtian alone contains more than half of all the reserves of this metal in China. Although the South Manchuria railway system is the largest single investment of the Japanese in this part of China, it is by no means the only one. With almost a million Koreans and Japanese in the three eastern provinces, and controlling an area in leased territory greater than the state of Rhode Island, Japan has been able to inaugurate all kinds of new movements here. She has built new towns along the route of the railway and has invested more than $500 million. The Japanese have founded industries for the manufacture of bean products, silk, porcelain, bricks, and glass, and have scattered schools, hospitals, and laboratories throughout these provinces. The public school system of the Chinese is still far inadequate to the educational needs of Manchuria, and the best institutions of learning here are conducted by missionaries or the Japanese. End of chapter 30。Chapter 31 of China by Frank G. Carpenter。This recording is in the public domain。Port Arthur, a fallen Gibraltar. I went out this morning to take a look at the battlefields of Port Arthur. They lie peaceful and quiet, the scars of war almost obliterated by the passing of two decades, and it is hard to realize that the huge natural amphitheater in which the city is built was for eight months the scene of the greatest gladiatorial show the world had then known. As I stood on the heights above it, I could look down upon the harbor and could see in my mind's eye 
the Russian gunboats that were bottled up there while the Japanese squadron lying outside fired shrieking shells at them. Facing the harbor is the city that the Russians once planned to make a second Gibraltar, and on the hills all about are the remains of the forts into which the Japanese armies crawled and plowed and tunneled their way. The story of how, inch by inch, every bit of this ground was fought over was, until the World War ten years later, the story of the bloodiest battles that had ever been fought. Although it remained for the Russians to make a great naval stronghold of Port Arthur, its natural advantages as a harbor had been recognized centuries before. History tells of boats putting in here for shelter as early as the rule of the Tang Dynasty from 620 to 907 A.D. At one time, because of the formation of the entrance to the harbor, it was known as the Lion's Mouth Port, and later by a Chinese name that meant Travel Facilitating Port. In 1857, during the hostilities between China and the combined English and French forces, this place was made the base of operations for the latter two countries, and was named Port Arthur in honor of young Prince Arthur, now the Duke of Connaught. Some years afterward, Li Hung Chang, recognizing its strategic importance, erected fortifications here that were occupied by the Chinese. With the lease of the Liao Tung Peninsula by Russia, the Tsar set about making Port Arthur the base of his naval operations in the Far East. Fort after fort was built on the hills that rose to the east, the north, and the west of the city. These forts were made of concrete, reinforced with steel, and they stood like sentinels in a semicircle more than ten miles long. They made Port Arthur one of the mightiest fortresses in the world, and one that the Russians looked upon as wholly impregnable. At the south, Port Arthur faced two almost landlocked bays that opened into the sea through a single narrow channel. On the shores of the western inlet was the old Chinese town. Along the eastern bay, the Russians laid out a new city designed on a magnificent scale. For their officials, they erected enormous office buildings and elaborate residences. They spent vast sums of money dredging the harbor, building wharves and docks, and in erecting additional forts to guard the port. The Port Arthur of those years was far different from the city of today. There were soldiers everywhere. Military officers in big caps and long coats swaggered through the streets. There was a large garrison. Everything was booming, and money and drink flowed like water. A circus building was erected in which all sorts of shows were held, and there were cafes and restaurants modeled after those of St. Petersburg and Moscow that became famous throughout the Far East. At the height of this period came the Russo-Japanese War. Japan had long been apprehensive of the Russian influence in Manchuria, and when the Tsar began to extend his activities into Korea also, the Mikado added armed force to his protests. Under Admiral Togo, the Japanese fleet surprised the Russian warships just outside of Port Arthur, sinking several and disabling many others. The remainder managed to retreat to the harbor where the Japanese dared not venture because of hidden mines, but by that time the Russian squadron was so badly crippled that it could not prevent the Japanese from landing their soldiers upon the Liaotung Peninsula and cutting off the troops in Port Arthur from the main Russian forces in Manchuria. With the Russians pressed back to the very edge of the Port Arthur fortifications, the siege of this city began. For almost six months, the Japanese soldiers and the Japanese artillery stormed the forts with a terrific loss of life. The country about Port Arthur looks much like the bare hills of Montana or Colorado. It is dry and thirsty, and there is no vegetation except scanty grass, with here and there a bit of scrub oak. The fighting was all in the open, and the fortifications had to be thrown up out of gravel and broken stone. The tunnels made by the Japanese were not through earth, but through rock, and in undermining the enemy forts, they could advance but a few feet a day. Nevertheless, they dug mile after mile of such trenches and tunnels. In burrowing into the forts, the Japanese were often within a few feet of the Russian trenches, 
and soldiers of the two armies remained so for days separated only by ramparts of sandbags a japanese officer accompanying me over the battlefields pointed out a tunnel in which he said he had fought for several days with the russians so close on the other side of the wall that the opposing troops could talk back and forth we even joked with one another using one of our men as an interpreter he said and we passed brandy and tobacco over the sandbags how did the russians fight i asked they fought bravely he replied but the odds were against them because their common soldiers did not know what they were fighting for they did not care for manchuria and they had no faith in their emperor on the other hand every japanese esteemed it an honor to die for his country and most of us preferred death to defeat the hardest fighting in the siege of port arthur took place in the capture by the japanese of what is now known as 203 meter hill this eminence though not so heavily fortified as were some of the other hills about the city was quickly recognized to be the most important strategic point near port arthur it overlooked the harbor and the other fortifications the russians realized that its capture meant the certain fall of the city and fought the more doggedly against the terrific onslaught of the japanese the siege lasted day and night from november twenty seventh to december sixth and turned the eyes of the whole world upon the struggle to quote from one of the guidebooks the japanese now sell to visitors to the battlefields this insignificant hill before the war have got now a world-wide fame three weeks after the fall of 203 meter hill port arthur surrendered to the japanese the terms of capitulation were discussed by generals noji and stossel in a little native house in the village of shui Xingying, which is now preserved as a historic relic in the meantime the fighting was going on through southern manchuria finally resulting in the fall of mukden the following march which marked the climax of the japanese operations it was at this point that president roosevelt invited japan and russia to make peace terms at a conference to be held in the united states and in the fall of 1905 the treaty of portsmouth new hampshire was signed according to the terms of the treaty the russians transferred their concessions in the liaotung peninsula to japan agreed to a hands-off policy as far as korea was concerned ceded half of the island of Sakhalin to Japan, and agreed to restore to China the three eastern provinces. Thus ended the Russian regime in South Manchuria. The Japanese officer who guided me over the battlefields was here when Port Arthur fell. He tells me that the Russians were crazy to get away, and that furniture of every kind went for a song. Sofas, tables, and chairs could be had for the taking, and grand pianos sold for twenty-five dollars apiece costly hangings were thrown out into the streets and some of the houses were set on fire by their owners after we took possession he told me i found our soldiers tearing up valuable books using them for fuel or throwing them into the snow and i besought the general in charge to allow me to go through the town and save the libraries he did so and when he saw how many books there were he gave me a detail of soldiers to bring them in we collected altogether about twenty thousand volumes most of them were printed in russian but there were a thousand or so in french and in english several hundred in italian and some in chinese and japanese i tried to catalogue them classifying them first by languages and later by subjects there were nine sets of encyclopedias all russian or german and a great many musical books there were also many scientific works but most of the volumes were fiction the russians had every luxury here they lived well and at the close even better than the japanese for by the terms of the capitulation we gave them fresh meat although we were living on canned stuffs the end of the war found every foot of ground about port arthur scarred by battle and the face of old mother earth pockmarked by the siege as soon as the fighting was over chinese by the thousands swarmed over the landscape and gathered up every bit of lead and iron in sight they even dug up the shells that had been buried deep in the ground often finding one that had not been exploded and innocently picking the cap the result was still another big hole in the earth and almond-eyed coolies scattered to the four winds 
they collected army buttons torn caps and coats and pieces of barbed wire that when charged with electricity had entangled the soldiers as they climbed the hills and burnt them to death most of these relics have since found their way into the war memorial museum east of the old town where to quote again from the aforementioned guidebook everything have long brave and bloody record another structure commemorating the war is the soldiers monument between the old and the new town it stands on a saddle-shaped hill that rises to a height of a thousand or more feet out of the arena of the amphitheater in which port arthur is located the first elevation to be seen as one comes into the city it faces the narrow entrance to the harbor where the japanese and russian gunboats showered shells upon one another and about it may be seen the fortified hills taken one by one by the japanese during the siege it is upon the top of this eminence that the soldiers monument towers more than two hundred feet into the air it is a great temple of silver gray granite whose stone came by the shipload from shimonoseki japan inside the tower is a spiral staircase and from the top i obtained a magnificent view of the harbor and the hills behind port arthur at the other end of the elevation perhaps eight hundred feet distant is a shinto shrine of this same silver gray granite under which lie the bones of more than twenty two thousand japanese who were killed at port arthur the way to the shrine is through a great bronze torii or gateway at each side of which is a granite lantern like those one sees in the temples at nikko and about the other shrines of japan the stone platform must be more than 100 feet square, although the shrine itself is comparatively small. These two monuments are reached by military roads that wind their way up the mountain and by flights of steps. The Japanese have erected also a little granite temple with a Greek cross upon its top as a monument to the dead among their enemies who fell at Port Arthur. This is situated at the foot of 203 meter hill and surrounding it are the graves of thousands of russian soldiers inside a brick wall enclosing several acres about the monument the officers are buried the grave of each being marked with a stone or an iron cross outside on the slopes of the hill stands a thicket of white wooden crosses rising to the height of a man's shoulder and marking the graves of the privates the inscriptions on the monument are in japanese and russian and they state that the memorial was erected by the emperor of japan in honor of the bravery of the soldiers of his great enemy russia but let us turn from the battlefields of port arthur to the city itself as it stands today it makes me think of one of the inflated towns of our own west after its boom has collapsed from a growing metropolis of one hundred thousand people its population has decreased to less than one-fifth that number the old forts have fallen into ruin except for the two that guard the harbor and aside from the naval station that the japanese maintain here there is little activity in the port indeed the chief importance of port arthur today is as an educational center and as the seat of the government offices for the leased territory it has several fine schools and colleges for both sexes to which chinese as well as japanese are admitted Port Arthur is also a popular resort, not only for Manchuria, but for Shanghai and Peking as well. Lying as it does at the extreme tip of the Liao Tung Peninsula, it is always cooled by sea breezes in summer and in addition has an excellent beach. A motor road built between here and Dairen, 37 miles away, has made it almost a suburb of that great port, and the old military stronghold of the Russians in south manchuria is now only an hour's drive from the new commercial stronghold the japanese have founded in the ancient land of the manchus today port arthur is only a symbol of the tragic outcome of the clash between two great forces of the far east its downfall marked the end of a chapter in the history of the struggle for supremacy in eastern asia and the next one is still unwritten for me it marks the end of these travels and I must leave it to others to tell the story of what is to come. The End End of Chapter 31 End of China by Frank G. Carpenter